Bibles, if you would, and turn to Second Chronicles chapter 15. Second Chronicles chapter 15. And I'm thankful to be here tonight, and I guess you've heard it said over and over again, it's better to be in a place like this than in the best hospital room in uh, the town. And if you don't believe that, just go visiting sometime, just go to the hospital sometime, spend about a half a day there talking to people. When you come out of there, you ought to be convinced that going to church is much better than laying in a hospital room. Uh, going to church is much better than uh, the best jail that the town has to offer. If you don't believe that, just go down there and uh, spend some time in the jail talking to some of those fellows. They'd do anything to get out. And you know, being right here a lot of times is better than uh, being home because uh, you can get in trouble at home, you know that? <laughs> some of you can. I mean, I can. I can get in trouble at home. Can't you? <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about? Man, what have y'all been doing? Fighting before you come to church? <laughs> well, knowing people and knowing the devil, you, some of you probably did, you know, because the devil's always going to resist, he's always going to fight you, and he's always going to make it rough on you doing what's right. Did you ever analyze that? I mean, if I'm going to have an argument with my wife, it'll always be Wednesday night about 5 o'clock. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you just have to catch on to this stuff after a while. Or it'll be... Sunday morning at 7 o'clock. Uh, you know, come on, get out of the bathroom. I, we've got six people in the house, one bathroom, get out of there. You had your chance. I've got to be over at the church. Well, I've got to be over too. Yeah, but you don't have to teach. I've got to teach. Well, I've got to be over there. Doesn't that ever happen to you? I mean, are you all normal like me or are you abnormal? You're abnormal. Okay. <laughs> Okay, well, it's good to be here, and uh, I, I just trust that you'll get something from the Word of God tonight. I pray that the Holy Spirit of God will deal with your heart, give you something that'll, uh, that'll challenge you, that'll stir you, and uh, give you something that'll help you out. Now, as, uh, as I've said many times, I don't have anything new, no new revelation. Uh, the longer I live, the more I'm convinced that I've never had an original thought in my entire life. I mean, when I get up to say something, uh, you know, about the first time you think you're saying something that no one else ever said or thought of, you read in a book that uh, D.L. Moody said it 100, over 100 years ago, you know, and uh, so I'm convinced that uh, anything I have to say tonight, it's not going to be new, it's not going to be original, but I just trust that the Holy Spirit can take complete charge of me and have me say the things that are needful for you to hear. And uh, if the Lord does that, then, uh, and, and you open your heart to it, then God will do something for you. And uh, let's, uh, let's realize one thing tonight, folks. If we come to church and we just go through the motions, that is one of the most deadening, damaging things that can happen to the child of God. If you come to church and you just get used to filing in through the door, hanging up your coat, sitting in your pew, opening up the hymn book, going through the songs, spending uh, 45 minutes, an hour, listening to the Word of God, hopping up, going out, and doing that over and over and over again, and nothing happens inside, the Holy Spirit doesn't convict you, the Holy Spirit doesn't work on you, then what's going to happen to you is you're going to end up just being another deadhead Christian. And brother, I'll tell you what, we've got churches filled up with that type of Christianity tonight, and a Bible-believing church should never be a dead place. There ought to be life in here. You know why? Because we've got the giver of life, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's inside. We've got the word of life uh, right here before us. And brother, there's no reason why there should be any deadness when Bible-believing Christians gather together for the preaching of the word of God. And uh, I trust that you'll pray. I hope you have been praying. And I trust that you will pray tonight that God will give you what you need because I certainly don't know what you need. I don't know what's been taking place in your life throughout the course of the last year or throughout the course of the last uh, week. But uh, God knows. And I'm just trusting that what God has laid on my heart tonight is something that someone in here needs to hear. Now, I don't care who it is. It might be one of these young kids in here that need to hear this message. It might be some older person in here that needs to hear this message. It might not be for all of you, but if God will speak to someone in here tonight, it may change things in this church. Because you see, it doesn't take everybody getting stirred to stir up a church. All it takes is just one or two or three people getting stirred. And brother, I'll tell you what, it can spread. But I, if, if one or two, three people just get dead and die, that can spread also. You know, there's a few things that'll just spread throughout a, 
uh, throughout a church. You, you know, one of the things that will spread fear is something that can spread. That's why I, I don't like to be around Christians that are fearful. They're, they're afraid of this and they're afraid of that. And oh, what, do you, what if we go out on the street? What do you think the law is going to do? Who cares what the law does? Is it what God wants you to do? Then go ahead and do it. And, and these people that are fearful, that fear is able to spread. And I'll give you a little example of how fear spreads. Uh, I was over at the church one day, or I was at the house one day, and I see um, uh, this man, a uh, member of the church, he went over to the church. And I thought he was putting a light bulb or a, a light socket that was requested of him to place in the church uh, in there. And lo and behold, about five minutes later, I see him come back, and he's carrying a vacuum cleaner. I thought, now that's strange. Why in the world is he carrying that vacuum cleaner? So I went over there, and his wife was cleaning the church. And I said, Ann, why are you using your vacuum cleaner? She said, well, there's something wrong with this one. I said, what's wrong with it? I was just using it uh, the other day. What's wrong with it? And she said, well, the thing that's wrong with it is there's a short in there, and the electric's gone through that handle, and it shocked me. I said, oh, you're kidding. I said, I just used that thing. There's nothing wrong with that. And she said, well, you try it. And so I grabbed a hold of it, and I plugged it in, and I, I got to thinking. Well, what if there is electric coming through this thing? And all of a sudden, I got scared. <laughs> and I punched that thing on with my foot, and I was going, hoo, 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 I can't. And you know something? I, I convinced myself that she was telling me the truth, and there wasn't any electric going through that. I, I, you know, she was dreaming, man. I mean, uh, she, a, a nerve must have twitched in her arm, and she thought she got an electrical shock, but there was no electric coming through that thing. But you know what it had me doing? It had me going like this. That fear spread to me. She was afraid of it, thought it was electric shocking her, so I got the same way. And you know, that kind of stuff can spread. Deadness can spread through a church. Life can spread through a church. Sorrow can spread through a church. Happiness can spread through a church. And if God will speak to your heart tonight and challenge you and stir you up and get you excited, brother, I'll tell you what, it can spread through this church. Take and look in Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 15. And tonight as we look at this passage of Scripture, let's remember this. That the Old Testament is for our learning and our, for our admonition. These things that God has recorded and preserved for us in the Old Testament is for our learning. The things that uh, these people went through, they're examples for us that we might be able to read these things and learn something from what these people experienced hundreds of years ago. A lot of times people read the Old Testament, they think, well, it's just a history of the nation of Israel. No, it's not. It's a history lesson a lot of times. It's an example many times. It's for something for you to read so that you can learn and learn from the problems and the mistakes that these people encountered when they were living on this earth uh, for their God. In Second Chronicles chapter 15, it says in verse 1, and the Spirit of God came upon Azariah, the son of Obed, Oded, and he went out to meet Asa and said unto him, Hear ye me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you while ye be with him. And if ye seek him, he will be found of you. But if ye forsake him, he will forsake you. Now for a long season Israel hath been without the true God and without a teaching priest, and without law. You know, if you're ever going to do anything for God, there's two things you need. If you're ever going to be pleasing to God and serve God, the two things you need is you need the Word of God. These people had been without the law, and brother, God wasn't blessing their lives. And one of the things you need is the Word of God. Then you need a teaching priest. You need a teaching preacher. You need a preacher that is going to not only preach to you, but teach you some things through the Word of God. And if a person's going to be pleasing to God and do something for the Lord and live for God and be successful in this life for the Lord Jesus Christ, then those are two things he's going to need. It says in verse 4, But when they in their trouble did turn unto the Lord God of Israel and sought him, he was found to them. And in those days there was no peace to him that went out, nor to him that came in, but great vexations were upon all the inhabitants of the countries. And nation was destroyed of nation and city of city, for God did vex them with all adversity. Sounds like the United States, doesn't it? I mean, uh, aren't we having problem one city to the next? 
Uh, every time you turn on the radio, pick up a newspaper. You know, Chicago, seven people killed at a restaurant. Uh, Los Angeles last spring. I mean, the whole place burning and people shooting and killing each other. I mean, uh, there's problems in our cities in this country. There's problems nationwide, nation against nation. Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, uh, all those nations over there fuming and fussing and uh, threatening and shooting. Sounds like this world today. It says in verse 7, Be ye strong therefore, and let not your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. And when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Obed the prophet, he took courage and put away the abominable idols out of the land of Judah and Benjamin and out of the cities which he had taken from Mount Ephraim and renewed the altar of the Lord that was before the porch of the Lord. And he gathered all Judah and Benjamin and the strangers with them out of Ephraim and Manasseh and out of Simeon, for they fell to him out of Israel in abundance when they saw that the Lord his God was with him. So they gathered themselves together at Jerusalem in the third month, in the fifteenth year of the reign of Asa. And they offered unto the Lord the same time of the spoil which they had brought, seven hundred oxen and seven thousand sheep. And they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul." that whatsoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel should be put to death, whether small or great, whether man or woman. And they swear unto the Lord with a loud voice and with strong shouting and with trumpets and with cornets. And all Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart and sought him with their whole desire. And he was found of them, and the Lord gave them rest round about. And also concerning... Uh, Maacah, the mother of Asa, the king, he removed her from being queen because she had made an idol in a grove, and Asa cut down her idol and stamped it and burnt it at the brook Kidron. But the high places were not taken away out of Israel. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was perfect all the days, all of his days. And he brought into the house of God the things that his father had dedicated and that he himself had dedicated silver and gold and vessels. And there was no more war unto the five and thirtieth year of the reign of Asa. Now here we have an account of a king. And this king was a king that God blessed. But the reason why God blessed this king is because this king got down to business with God. This king got serious with God. This king came to the place where, brother, he did some things that proved to God that he meant business. If you look at those verses that I just read, some of those, look in verse 12. It says, And they entered into a covenant to seek the Lord of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul. You know, these people showed how, how uh, desirous they were to have God bless them by entering into a covenant with God. You know, that's hard for Christians today to understand. We've got this soft Christianity today. We have this Christianity where we don't want any conditions placed upon us. Let me ask you something. Have you ever made a vow to God? Well, don't answer it. Because <laughs> I know exactly what you're thinking of. You're thinking of that verse over in Ecclesiastes where it says, It'd be better not to make a vow unto the Lord than to make a vow and not to pay the vow. Well, what about just making the vow and paying the vow? You know, today you don't have the kind of preaching that makes people commit to their God and make vows unto their God because I've heard preachers say, well, you know, it'd just be better off not to make that vow. Listen, when I got married to my wife 24 years or 3 years ago, we stood before a preacher and we took some vows before God that we were going to love, honor, and obey in sickness and in health, in rich, uh, rich poor, whatever, we were going to stay together and love one another. And you know what that was? That was a vow that we took as saved people before God, knowing exactly what we were doing. But you know, Christians won't take a, make a vow today to God. Listen, there was a time when I made a vow to the Lord. 
And I said, Lord, if you'll do this, by the grace of God, I'll do this thing over here. And you know something? God came through for me, and by the grace of God, I measured up and tried to measure up to that vow I made. But you know, there's a lot of people today that they don't like that kind of preaching. They don't like to hear that kind of thing. They want this non-committal type of Christianity where there's no responsibility on your part to God. And yet we have great responsibility. We are debtors unto the Lord that saved our soul and given us has given us this book and has given us eternal life. And brother, we owe a debt to God. Amen. You might as well just learn to say amen and say something because it's going to be like this all night tonight. <laughs> so just enjoy, okay, if you can. <laughs> Notice what happened to the people that weren't willing to get down to business with God. Look what happened in verse 13. That whosoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel should be put to death, whether small or great, whether man or woman. I mean, I'd say this was pretty serious, wouldn't you? They made a covenant with God, and then anybody that didn't want to get in on this covenant, they were to be put to death. I mean, I wonder what it would do in our churches today if we had some fellows come up, you know, and they had 357s and 44s and... And stuff like that. And we said, okay, uh, tonight we're all going we're gonna, to we're gonna get down to business. We're going to make some vows to God. We're, we believe this book. We believe Jesus is coming back. We believe we've been left here to do something for God. Now, everybody that's going to get down to business, let's come up here and let's pray and let's make some vows before God. And the ones that stay back in the seat, you're going to get shot. <laughs> I mean, that's what they did. That's what it says there. You know, I think people would take a, a, a different attitude toward Christianity if we would just get serious about what God has left us here to do. Notice in verse 14. It says, And they swear unto the Lord with a loud voice and with shouting and with trumpets and with cornets. You know, the shouting didn't come until they got serious with God. The reason why there's not a shout in a lot of camps is because people just have not gotten down to business with God and they will not identify themselves with the truth of the Word of God when it is preached and they have lost their shout because they know when the preaching comes across, if they're back there saying, Amen, glory to God, that's right, brother, preach it, then they're going to have to go out and live according to way, the way they agreed with the preaching or else they're going to look, look like a hypocrite. So you know what people do? They say, well, I'm not going to be a hypocrite about it. I'll just listen to him. But I'm not going to say anything. And I'm not going to get excited about this. And I'm not going to take it too seriously. Notice in verse 15, it says, And all Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart, and sought him with their whole desire. And he was found to them, and the Lord gave them rest round about. It says when these people had uh, sought Him with uh, their heart and with their whole desire, it says all Judah rejoiced at the oath. There was some rejoicing when people got serious and got down to business with God. And because of that, God blessed the reign of Asa. And Asa didn't wind up too good. But you know something? God blessed that man for 45, 41 years because of what he did in the beginning of his reign. Because of that, God blessed him for the entire reign. Even though when you read chapter 16, you find out that Asa didn't fare too well in the end. Tonight I want to preach to you for a little bit about getting serious about God. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, tonight I'm thankful for each person that's come this way. And I pray now, Lord, that you would just take and stir our hearts with the Word of God and take this message and, Father, put it upon me in such a way that, Lord, it comes out the way you want it to come out. And that, Father, it might have an effect on somebody in this building tonight. God, I pray that if there's some person in here that's saved, know that that they know that they're saved, but yet they just have never made that true, honest, whole surrender and commitment to you to do whatever you want them to do. God, I pray that you'd deal with their heart tonight. Lord, I pray that you'd raise up some people in this church. And God, I know there's some folks that are serious about you and there's some folks that are serious about serving you. But Lord, I am convinced that no matter what church I would go in tonight, there are always some that just have never sold out 
Lord, I pray that you would speak to some heart tonight. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. As you read about the reign of Asa, there's some things that Asa did, and because he did them, it pleased God. And because he was pleasing to God, God blessed his reign. You know, if this Old Testament is for our learning and for our example and for our admonition, then I would say this to you tonight, that just like Asa came to the place in his life where he got down to business for God and got serious for God, so you and I ought to get serious for doing what God has left us here to do. I think it's high time that we as Christians get serious. I'm talking about getting serious about doing some things for the Lord. You know, it's funny, we can get so serious over playing sports. We can get so serious about getting on a diet and getting the old flesh and getting the old body into shape. But brother, when it comes to serving God, it seems like our seriousness doesn't carry too far into the course of a year. I think we ought to get serious about winning souls. Brother, this may well be the last year that you and I are ever on the face of this earth, and there are still many souls out here that are lost, gone to hell. They need to be saved. They might have heard before. They might have received a track. But we haven't fulfilled our obligation just because we've knocked on the door once and left a track at the door or even witnessed to that person one time. That doesn't mean that we fulfilled our obligation. Brother, we need to get serious about winning souls. We need to get serious about serving God. I think there's some people that come to Bible-believing churches and they come there because they've been taught that this Bible's right and this Bible's true and that's the place to go and they like to hear the preaching hard and they like to hear it hot and loud but brother, they have just got used to coming in and listening to the sermon or maybe watching the little show but never go out and serve the Lord God. I think we need to get serious about serving God. I think we need to get serious about stirring up an area and affecting that area with the truth. You know, it's important for a church to have an effect on the area that it's in. And when I say have an effect on the area, that means that if the area is surrounded with heresy, then brother, that church preaches out against that heresy and I know what will happen because believe me down there where I'm at you go into Highland County it says the 17 churches of Christ of Highland County welcome you every time I get up to preach on the radio or in the pulpit and I say something about the water dogs or the church of Christ lo and behold somebody has brought a friend and they have a church of Christ background or somebody that's sitting there has relatives or friends that are in the church of Christ and they just sort of, sort of draw up and shrivel up but listen brother if we're serious about doing something for God, we need to be stirring the area up with the truth of the Word of God. And when we don't stir the area up, the devil moves in with every kind of cult and every kind of falsehood and every kind of heresy that he can bring into a place. And that's why this country is just like a great big old tree for the birds of the air. That's why uh, in this country right now, you have all kinds of Muslims, you have all kinds of New Agers, you have all kinds of uh, people that claim they believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. But brother, I'll tell you what, they have believed a lie and we are in sad condition spiritually in this nation tonight because there's some people in Bible-believing churches that just haven't got serious about stirring the area up with the truth, the Word of God. I believe that we ought to be serious about fighting sin and wickedness. It seems like because we are surrounded with sin on every hand, we have become insensitive to what sin does and the effects that sin has on our lives. Listen, every, you can't go to bed at night without getting down on your knees and asking God to cleanse the sin out of your heart that you've been exposed to in the course of the day. Because your soul is affected by the things you see and the things you hear. That's the two things that affect your soul. The ears, the hearing, and the seeing. And brother, I'll tell you what. You're going to see things in the course of a day that you may not have wanted to see, but you saw them. And you're going to hear things in the course of a day that you may not have wanted to hear, but you hear them. And if you just keep on going day after day after day, and you never get down to business about sin that you've been exposed to, and confess that stuff and get it right, then you know what's going to happen? You're going to find yourself in a sinful mess. And then you're not going to want to fight sin in your life. And then it's going to take over. I believe it's time for God's people to get down to business and get serious. I made a statement at the church. I preached this at my church. And I made a statement at the church one night back at the prayer room. 
I said, you know something, folks? I said, we've been marking time too long. You know what marking time is? That's a military term. Marking time, when you're marching, you're supposed to take a 32-inch step, and I think it's a 32, 32-inch 32 step. I don't know what it was. But they told us about it in the military, and there was a certain uh, length of a step that you were supposed to take when you were marching. But when they would say, you'd be marching along, and they'd say, mark time, hoop. You kept marching. And they'd laugh, right, laugh. They might stand you in that place for 15 minutes, and you're marching, but you're not going anyplace. And you know, that's exactly what has happened in the body of Christ. There's a bunch of Christians that are just marking time. I told our people down there, I said, we need to quit marking time and start going forward. And when you quit going forward, you're either marking time or you're going backward. <laughs> and either way, the devil has you where he wants you. Whether you're marking time or going backwards, the devil's got you just where he wants you. Somebody went out of that prayer room, and you know what they said? They said, Brother McDowell has declared war on all the churches in the area. <laughs> That's what they said. Brother McDowell has declared war on all the churches in the area. And, you know, a small community. Now, now, now Carmi and Frank, they understand this because they live in a small community. But if I blow my nose in the post office at 9 o'clock, everybody in town knows I blew my nose at the post office by 9.15. Everybody in town knows about it. <laughs> And you know, it wasn't about a day later than what I said in that prayer room came back to me. And somebody said, hey, I heard you declared war on all the churches in the area the other night. I said, what? They said, yeah, back at the prayer room. I said, man, I didn't do anything. Boy, the next, the next Sunday morning rolled around, I got up and I said, listen. I said, whoever went out of here and said that I declared war on all the churches around us is telling a bald-faced lie. I said, I haven't declared the war. God declared the war. And God declared the war on sin. And God declared war on the devil. And God declared war on apostasy. And if the churches around this area are in apostasy, then we're supposed to be standing for the truth and doing what's right. And you figure it out. But I said, I never said I was declaring war on all these churches. <laughs> You know what I said? We need to quit marking time and start going forward for the Lord. We need to be serious about the Lord. We need to be turning the area upside down for God. We need to be militant. We need to be aggressive. We need to quit laying back and just letting the devil have his way and do whatever he wants to do. If you're not standing for the Lord and stirring up a little something wherever you go, then you're not following the Apostle Paul. Are you? I mean, didn't Paul say, be ye followers of me as I am of Christ? Didn't he say that? Am, am I preaching the truth to you folks tonight now? I mean, didn't the Apostle Paul stir things up wherever he went? In Acts chapter 17, with it, when he was in Athens, didn't the, did, what, did, wasn't his spirit stirred within him? And didn't he start proclaiming up there on Mars Hill that you do ignorantly worship the unknown God? Brother, I'll tell you what. If Paul went every place and stirred things up by preaching the truth, then if you're a Bible-believing Christian that is following the example of Paul, you know what's going to happen? You're going to go in and somebody's going to say, well, I believe this. And you say, well, <laughs> okay. Go ahead and believe that, but you'll believe, be believing wrong because the Bible says this. And you know what that'll do? That'll stir up a controversy. As soon as you say Bible, as soon as you say Scriptures, as, you, as soon as you say, look what the Word of God has to say, then you'll be a rebel rouser. That's what they did with the Apostle Paul. They accused him of stirring up and turning the world upside down. Brother, I'll tell you what, it's high time for God's people that believe this book to be the kind of Christian God expects us to be. You say, we're living in a different time. Maybe so, but that doesn't mean that we have to be a different kind of Christian. We still need to be Bible-believing Christians that are standing for this book and doing what God wants us to do. And you know, if you come to this church and, and you're the kind of person that wants to come in and have your ears tickled, then you know what I would suggest? I would suggest going to a Methodist church or a Presbyterian church, or a Church of Christ, or someplace else where you can get your ears tickled, but don't expect to come into a Bible-believing church where the truth is going out and have your ears tickled because, brother, I'll tell you what, the truth will not tickle sometimes. The truth will hurt sometimes. But the truth is what you need, and the truth is what I need. 
And we need to come to the place where we get serious about doing what God left us here to do. Asa was a man that got serious. He got serious. And because he got serious, God blessed him. Now, you know something? I believe this. I believe that when you have a, a, a handful, a, a group of Bible-believing Christians, then you have the most effective church in that area. I told Brother Art, when I went to the church down there in Sinking Spring, a community of 200 people, I didn't go with visions of running 150, 175, or 200 people in church. I didn't go with that idea in mind because I know that there is no way that a church down there in a little country community like that is ever going to reach that kind of a membership or that kind of an attendance. I didn't go with that in mind. You know what I went to that church with, with the goal in my heart and in my mind? I went there to take a, a small group of people and challenge them with the Word of God and teach them to the place where they could become strong in the Word of God and then carry the Word of God out and have an effect. And brother, the only thing that I'm down there to do is to affect that area with the Word of God. And you know, God's given us everything that we need to affect it. He's given us a tape ministry. I mean, we've got the technology. The technology, we've got a tape ministry. We've got a radio ministry. Uh, you guys got the track ministry, so we have an endless supply of tracks. And uh, uh, we have a, a computer down there that we can just wipe out everything. We've got a copier. We've got all the technology that we need. You know what's missing? I'll tell you what's missing. People with heart. People with dedication. People that are consecrated. People that have a desire to stir the area up for the Lord Jesus Christ. And brother, I'll tell you what. It's time to get busy for God. You have the building here. You've got the printing presses over there. You've got enough room to bring people in here and disciple those people and teach those people and get those people strong in the Lord so that they can go out as soldiers for Jesus Christ and have an effect on this area. And that's what God's put you here for. But you know, when that doesn't happen, it's because people just are not serious about God. And it's, and it's easy. It's easy to spot the people that aren't serious. You know, the people that are serious about the Lord... They'll be in this church every time the doors open. And the people that aren't serious about the Lord, anything and everything will keep them out. You know, there is something... I, now, Brother Art, he might not have ever said this to you, but there are some things that aggravate a pastor. And there are some things that aggravate me. I don't check on a person when they haven't come to church for about three weeks. You know, I, I wait until about three weeks before I check on them. Because as soon as they missed one Sunday, I used to check on them. And they'd say, oh, Brother McDowell, no, I, I was okay. I wasn't sick. If we had a family reunion. Then I wished I hadn't even asked, you know. I a family reunion? Well, why, why don't they have their family reunions on Saturday? I mean, if my family had a family reunion one time a year and it was on a Sunday, they wouldn't like it if I missed. They expect me to be there on Sunday, not at some family reunion. You know something? I expect the same thing. And, you know, I found out uh, that the best way to do it, let them go for about three weeks before I even check on them. <laughs> you know, I, I used to, as soon as somebody would miss a Sunday, I used to get on the phone I used to call them up and say, oh, is everything okay? What's going on? Oh, we had a, well, the scouts had a meeting. The scouts, the what? The scouts had a meeting. What's more important? The boy scouts, the girl scouts, or church? I used to call them up, you know, and I'd say, is everything okay? They said, oh, yeah, uh, I, I, I was sick. And I said, well, I, I'm sorry about that. I'll be praying for you. Well, thank you, Brother McDowell. I appreciate that. They were okay on Saturday. They got sick on Sunday. But bless God, they went to work on Monday. <laughs> it's funny about these Sunday sicknesses, man. I mean, oh, my stomach was upset. I had a split and a headache. I was snotting at the nose. I was throwing up and I had diarrhea all at the same time. But bless God, they were at work on Monday morning. Cure, just like that. Instant healing. I have healings like that every week at the church. You know what I found out? I found out that some people just aren't serious about doing anything for God because they let every little old thing in the book keep them from doing what they ought to be doing. I always thought, after I got saved, 
that not only was it my responsibility, not only was it my duty, but brother, if I was sold out to God, I had an obligation to be in that church when the preaching of the Word of God was taking place. And I found out today that Christians... They've learned all the doctrine. They've had all the fascinating teachings. They know the dispensations. They know premillennial, postmillennial, all millennial. They know about Daniel's 70th week and what happened in the 69th week and what starts the 70th week and what's going to happen in the middle of the 70th week and what's going to happen at the end of the 70th week and the 30-day difference at the end of the 70th week. They've got it all figured out. They can rightly divide the Word of God so good that they can split the hair and have it fall neatly right the way it's supposed to fall, but bless God, let me tell you something, they can take it or leave it when it comes to church. You know what I say about that? I say, you're not serious about doing anything for God when that's your attitude toward the ministry that God has placed you to serve with. Amen, Brother McDowell, you're doing okay. <laughs> Amen. You know what happened to Asa? You know why God blessed Asa? It's because Asa got down to business and he got serious about serving God. Now, I got the introduction out of the way. See, since you people sat around fellowship so long last night, I said, bless God, I'm not going to preach one of them short sermons tonight. I'm going to load both barrels and I'm going to blast. <laughs> and I haven't even gotten the first barrel all the way empty yet, but I'm going to go to the second barrel. Now, I want you to notice some things that the Bible says about Asa. When he got serious about God, there was some things that took place. There was a reason why God blessed Asa. And the first thing that I want you to notice about Asa getting serious is found in verse 8. Look in verse 8 there. It says, When Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Oded the prophet, he took courage. You know the first thing I see about getting serious for God? It's going to take courage. This is not a message for the faint-hearted. This is not a message for the Sunday morning Sunday school Christian. This is not a message for somebody that just wants to tip their hat to God. This is for somebody that wants to live for the Lord Jesus Christ for the rest of the days of their life and know that there is a personal God taking a personal interest in His life and blessing Him or her in a personal way. It takes courage. You know something? If you're going to stand for God, it's going to take courage because you're going to find that sometimes you're standing all by yourself. I don't know of any pastor that is really doing the job for God, that is really ministering the way he ought to be ministering, that feels like that he has a great big bunch of support. Oh, he might have one or two faithful men that he knows is going to be there through thick or thin. But brother, I'll tell you what, most of the time that guy is out on the limb with his neck stretched out. And brother, I'll tell you what, it's lonely out there. And it's going to take courage. You know something? If you're ever going to stand for God, if you're ever going to make a difference, if you're ever going to live the life that God wants you to live, then you're going to have to have some courage because it might mean that you'll lose some friends. Some of you young kids, you want to live for God? Well, let me tell you something. It won't be easy if you want to live for the Lord. There's going to be kids in school that make fun of you. There's going to be kids at school that don't want you around. There's going to be kids that won't have anything to do with you. Everybody else will get invited home or get invited to a party or get invited to a ball game, but you'll be alone if you want to live for God. But I'll tell you what, it's worth living for God. And that just doesn't apply to the young kids. It's the same way with you. You go back to your community, you live for God, and brother, I'll tell you what, they'll cut you off. There, I've been in that community down there, living in that community for two years, been to the church for three years, and you know something? There's still people that will drive by my house, and I'll go like that, and they just, like I don't even exist. The Lord bless you. <laughs> the Lord bless you. I hope you don't die and go to hell. <laughs> I'm going to do everything I can do to get the truth to you. But brother, I'll tell you what. I'm not going to be one of these nice little old preachers that is able to appease everybody in the community and have the open house so that everybody can run up there and see what a nice little old church that we have because, bless God, when they come up, they're going to get preached to out of the Word of God. And you know something? It takes some courage to stand because sometimes you find yourself standing alone. I'll tell you something else. 
If you're going to be a person that gets serious about God, you're going to have to do what's right. And you know, it takes courage to do what's right. The crowd is not interested in doing right. And you know what I found out? I found out there's a lot of Christians that aren't interested in doing what's right. Especially if doing what's right costs them something. And brother, doing what's right is always going to cost you something. It takes courage to do what's right. You know something? It's worth it. It's worth it to get serious about God because, brother, let me tell you something, when the hard time comes, and the hard times are coming, we went to two places today where the businesses are going bankrupt and they're shutting down. Businesses are shutting down. The economy is on the rocks. Our nation is not doing good. Our nation is going downhill. I believe Brother Nart and I were talking about it the other night. You know what they've done? They have uh, 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 disbanded this, uh, the SAC, the Strategic Air Command. Did you know that? How many of you here in here knew that we no longer have the Strategic Air Command in action? Raise your hand. It's not. For 30 years, while you were awake, while you were sleeping, we had bombers up there. And brother, I'll tell you what, they had nuclear warhead bombs on them. And if Russia would have ever even thought about triggering one of those intercontinental ballistic missiles, man, SAC would have been right over there and dropped everything they had. And they would, from the air, would have been able to command a retaliation upon that nation. And you know what we've done? We've quit SAC. They no longer fly. The planes sit on the ground. You know what else we've done? We have taken away and gotten rid of all of our intercontinental continental ballistic missiles. Russia hadn't. Russia has them things sitting over there, and you know where they're pointed? <laughs> the United States. Somebody says, why are they pointed to the United States? They say, well, where else are we going to point them? <laughs> Man, things aren't good in this country. Things are bad. And brother, the only hope you and I have is for Jesus to come back. And if Jesus doesn't come back, you're going to want him to be there. When the going gets tough. But you know something? If you're not serious about God now, why should He get serious about you when the hard times come? You ever think about that? I do. And brother, I'll tell you what. It takes courage to do what's right. But it's worth doing what's right. Asa was a man that the Bible says he took courage. Something else. It takes courage to serve the Lord. You know, if you're going to serve God... It's going to take courage because in order for you to serve God, you have to make yourself available. And when I say make yourself available, I mean this. God is not going to force you into service. The only way that you are ever going to serve God is if you volunteer. Isaiah did. Isaiah did. He said, here my Lord, send me. You know what Isaiah was? He was a volunteer for his God. And if you're going to serve God, you're going to have to volunteer. You're going to have to come to God and say, Okay, Lord, I want to serve you because you saved me and you're worth living for and you're worth serving. I want to serve you. I read a story one time about Doolittle and his raiders. If you've never read that book, it's an interesting book. You know, Doolittle, he got a bunch of men to fly off the aircraft carrier Hornet and fly to Tokyo... And when those men volunteered, it was all volunteer. No one was drafted into that thing. It was a completely volunteer situation. When they volunteered, all they were told is, if you volunteer, you will go on a very dangerous mission for your country, and chances are you will die. And they volunteered. Even after they volunteered, the mission was so top secret that they did not tell these men what they were training for. They took them out there and taught them how to take B-25s off of short runways. And that's all they did. They practiced taking off real short. Getting that thing, jerking that thing off the ground and making that baby fly with a full load and just on the edge of a stall. And they thought, why are we doing this? This is crazy. What are we doing this for? They didn't tell them. You know, it wasn't until they got to the place where they were loading up on the, pl on the aircraft carrier and taking them to where they were going to try to get to to depart from that aircraft carrier, and there had never been a B-25 take off of an aircraft carrier. And then they told them, you fellows are on a mission, and your mission is going to be to fly off the Hornet, and it's going to be a one-way trip. 
and we hope we can get you close enough to where you can drop your bombs and then fly over into China. But you know something? The weather prevented them from getting within the range that they wanted to get to. And every one of those men, they took off knowing that if they did get there and drop their bombs, they were going to have to make an emergency crash landing, maybe in hostile territory, maybe in the sea. They volunteered. And I thought to myself, here were young men that are willing to do that for their country. Why is it that Christians can't volunteer to serve the Lord that saved them from hell and promised them a home in heaven? And brother, I'll tell you what, if you're going to serve God, it's going to be a thing where you're going to have to make yourself available. To serve God means this. It means serving Him on His terms. Not on your terms. What God wants you to do, where He wants you to do it. And it might be down in Mexico. It might be in Africa. It might be in Russia. But that's not for you to decide. That's for God to decide. And you just have to go. You know, we sort of have this crazy idea that if we volunteer, then we get to pick what we're going to do and where we're going to do it. I'm not pastoring a church because that's what I desire to do. Even though the Bible says, if a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. You know what I did? I said, God, if you want me to do it, I'm willing. I'm willing. I always told God that. I said, I don't want to do it, but if you want me to do it, I'm willing. And then it got to the place where I said, okay, God, if you want me to do it, not only am I willing, but I'll go wherever you open the door. I didn't think he was going to open the door in sinking spring. How many of you know where that is? You looked it up on the map. You know where it is. <laughs> well, you've got to look for a while before you're going to find it. But if you look on a map, you find Columbus. Then you find Washington Courthouse. Then you find Hillsborough. And then you find Peebles. And when you find Peebles, you come back up the road 10 miles, and there's a little circle there. I mean, it doesn't have a yellow circle or, or uh, 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 even a colored dot. It's just a little round circle. It's sinking spring. You know, if you go into Sinking Spring, the first thing you're going to see as you go down the hill is a, uh, is a row of an apartments, and it looks like they came right out of Mexico. I mean, they're all tore down, the windows are broke out, and we have the highest rate of welfare in Pike County, Southern Highland County, and Adams County than any place in the state of Ohio, right there. <laughs> I'm always having people coming over asking for a handout. I mean, if I was going to choose a place to serve, I would not have chosen Sinking Spring. When I went to Sinking Spring, the church said, Well, we don't have enough money to pay you full time, but we want you full time. I said, Oh, great. Well, I've lived for faith, by faith for 18 years, man. It's just a little extension of that. I never had anything promised all the 18 years I was working out on the street. And God took care of me there. And I said, okay, don't worry about it. I'll be full-time by the grace of God if that's what the Lord wants. As long as I can keep food on the table for the family, I'll do it. And they say, we have a house. And I said, well, good. That's great. Praise the Lord. And I went and looked at the house and I said, man, I can't live in this house. I said, I got four kids, man. We're talking about two bedrooms, four kids. We went from a five-bedroom farmhouse to a three-bedroom house in Cincinnati and we made two bedrooms in the basement and now I'm looking at a two-bedroom house and there's not even room to put any more bedrooms. And the fellow said, well, you know, we prayed about this a long time. I said, don't say anything else. I'll move into it. Don't worry about it. You know something? I didn't choose to go to that place. I went there because I said, God... If you want me to pastor, I'll pastor. If you want me to go, I'll go. You open the door, I'll be there. And the Lord opened the door. And I went. And I've been there for three years. You say, how long are you going to stay? I hope till the rapture. I don't have any intentions of going any place. Now, you know something? There's a bunch of people in that church didn't think I'd last for two years. There's some of them didn't think I was going to last for two months. But brother, I'll tell you what, I don't have any plans of going any place unless, unless God says, I want you to move. And then there's nothing. There is absolutely nothing that can keep me in sinking spring. You see, serving God means making yourself available and then going where God wants you to go. Not you picking the field saying, Lord, I want to go here. I want to go there. You know what serving the Lord means? 
It means denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following Him. You know, I left two girls in Cincinnati when I went to Sinking Spring. Both of those girls moved within 10 minutes of the house that we had bought. When we bought that house, people thought, there he is, he's going to be there. He bought a house. (laughs) I bought a house one year, and two years later, I sold the house. You know why? Because God didn't want me in Cincinnati. God wanted me in Sinking Spring. You say, how did you sell the house? We took a sign out there and said, for sale by owner, and pounded it into the ground, and the guy next door had been trying to sell his house for eight months. (laughs) And he watched me move out of the neighborhood. You know why? God wanted me in Sinking Spring. You take up your cross, you deny yourself, and you follow Him. But you're not going to do that unless you're serious. You're not going to serve God unless you are serious about doing what God wants you to do. I want you to notice the next thing about Asa in verse 8. It says, And when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Oded the prophet, he took courage and put away the abominable idols out of all the land of Judah and Benjamin and out of the cities which he had taken from Mount Ephraim and renewed the altar of the Lord that was before the porch of the Lord. You know what Asa did? After he took courage, brother, he dealt with sin. You know, if you are going to get serious about God, then you're going to have to deal with sin. There were some abominable idols. And if you read over there in 1 Kings, or is it 2 Kings? 1 and 2 Kings about Asa, uh, you find out that he also did away with the Sodomites. God is against Sodomites. God has always been against Sodomites. God was against them in Genesis chapter 19. God was against them when they showed up in Israel. God is against them today. And brother, I don't care what Clinton says about putting queers in the service. It's not an alternate lifestyle. It's an abomination in the sight of God. And don't you let the press condition you into thinking, well, these poor people, they have their rights. You know what that means? They have the right. You give them their rights, they're going to pervert your child. That means as soon as the, as, as the, the, the gay lifestyle rights is uh, put into effect, it'll do the same things that the civil rights did when they passed that law. It took your rights away. You don't have any rights. You know what Marge Schott did? She made the mistake of saying nigger. Now, I don't say that to be smart. I don't say that to offend you. But brother, let me tell you something. Those black rappers will get and they'll make a rapping tape talking about the white cops that they're going to kill. And those, those black people can call you honky and cracker and redneck and whitey and white trash. And brother, old, old, uh, old, what, what's that stupid, uh, guy that's supposed to be the spokesman for him down there? What's that guy's name? Jesse. Jesse, Jack Leg, Jack Ass Jackson. (laughs) Brother, let me tell you something. He can get up and call New York Heine Town, and everybody says, well, you know, a little slip of the tongue there. I didn't mean anything by it. But he wants to take property away from Marge Schott for saying the N word. And not only does he want her to be removed as owner of the Reds ball team, he wants her to make reparation, he wants her to pay. You know what I say? I say baloney, man. If you don't like it, go back to Africa. You love your African roots? You love your African name? Then hop on a boat and go back to Somalia and starve to death with them. And brother, let me tell you something. They passed this gay rights thing and they're going to have the right to take your child and teach your child in school, in kindergarten, in first and second grade that here's mommy and daddy, man and woman. Here's daddy and daddy. They have a child. Here's mommy and mommy. They had a child. Well, why is this one mommy and daddy and they have children and this one's daddy and daddy and mommy and mommy and then what what happened there? It's an alternate lifestyle. And they teach your child that this is something that's good and this is something that is acceptable and then the queers get into school and they start teaching it in the school and they start making passes at your kids in school and start perverting them in grade school and you won't be able to do a cotton-picking thing about it. 
Brother, let me tell you something. A sodomite has been something that God has always been against, and He's against it right now. You know what Asa did? He dealt with sin. You know what the sin he dealt with? He had dealt with the abominable idols, and he dealt with the sodomites. You know, when it comes to dealing with sin, you know what we have to deal with? Number one, we have to deal with our personal sin. We have to deal with our personal sin. And, and, and like I said earlier, you and I, we sin every single day. Don't you get it in your mind that because you're a housewife sitting at the home, you don't sin. You sin. You sin at the house. You sin in the car. You sin at the job. Don't you sit there and act like you don't sin. Is every thought that comes through your mind pure? Is every motive of your heart right and pure and acceptable in the sight of God? I mean, I, I, I don't listen to Charles Stanley. I mean, I, I don't make it a practice to listen. I don't have anything against the man. Don't know the man. I hear he's a good preacher. But I listened to a program he had on the radio the other day, and it was on a thought. And brother, I'll tell you what. That was one of the most convincing sermons I ever heard on the thought life. How that a person has a thought, and they, first of all, entertain the thought, and then they enjoy the thought, and then they act upon the thought, and brother, I'll tell you what, he just laid that thing out, laid it out, laid it out. And brother, I'll tell you what, he just said, sin all over it. You sin. You know what you have to do? You have to deal with sin. If you're going to be serious about God, you and I have to deal with sin. I know my sin. I know my shortcomings. I know my failures. I know my weaknesses. Brother, I know them better than anyone else. And I've got to deal with those things on a continual basis. And if you haven't been dealing with sin, you're not serious about God. You say, how do you deal with sin? Take your book and turn to Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28. Wisest man in the world, he tells you how to deal with sin. Proverbs chapter 28. Look what it says there. Here's how you deal with sin. Proverbs 28 and verse 13. He that covereth his sin shall not prosper. You know what we do? We do the same thing with our sin as we do with our face. We have a little blemish, we cover it up. I mean, you know, ladies get in front of the mirror and they put the the foundation on. And then they put the makeup on. And then they put the eyeshadow on and the curly eyes. You say, what are they doing? They're just covering up. Covering up. You say anything wrong with that? Not for some of you. <laughs> but, <laughs> come on now. You're just getting too serious here. Now, but, but you know something? We do the same thing with our sin. We just sort of, you know, we lift up the carpet and we go... I'm fine. You fine? Good. Groovy. Cool. Hey, man. We're all doing good. We're Bible believers around here. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That's not the way you deal with sin. You know how you deal with sin? It says, He that covereth his sin shall not prosper, but whosoever confesseth. That's the first thing. You confess them. That Bible says, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, the first thing you have to do with sin, first of all, you have to acknowledge it's sin. First of all, you have to acknowledge that some of those thoughts you've had are sin. Some of those motives you've had are sin. Some of those temptations you've had are sin. Some of those acts that you've committed are sin. Some of those words that you've said are sin. Some of that gossip that you spread is sin. You've got to acknowledge that it's sin. And then the next thing you have to do is you have to confess it. You have to take that thing to the Lord. He's your high priest. You don't have to take it to me. You don't have to take it to Brother Martin. You don't have to take it to uh, Mr. Flopdoodle down the road. You take that thing to your high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, and you come clean. And you say, God, I've sinned. Lord, I'm a sinner. And you confess that thing. And then you get up and you're clean. And the sin's forgiven and the relationship's established. But you've got to forsake it. It says, But whosoever confesseth and forsaketh and forsaketh them shall have mercy. That's how you deal with sin. You acknowledge the sin, you confess the sin, you forsake the sin. You know what we need to do? If we're going to be serious about God, we have to deal with sin. Not only do we have to deal with our personal sin, but we have to deal with the collective sins of this age. And when I say the collective sins of this age, brother, I'll tell you what, we're living in the Laodicean age and there's sin that goes along with this age. You know what lukewarmness is? It's sin. It makes God sick. It's sin. Yeah, I mean, if you're just, if you're just, just right. That's luke, you know, lukewarm. 
I don't like cold coffee. I don't like lukewarm coffee. I like hot coffee. Brother Art likes his lukewarm. He, he, drank, he drank a big old swig of hot coffee today. He, he looked over at me and tears were coming out of his eyes. Man, I swallowed it too soon. <laughs> I like it hot, man. I mean, blow on that baby a little bit and just mm, sip it until it just, you know, you can't take too much. <laughs> but, you know, we, we sort of have gotten used to everything being, you know, lukewarm. If it's just lukewarm, it's okay. You go to the hamburger shop, a lukewarm hamburger, and it's a lukewarm bowl of soup, and it's a lukewarm this. And, you know, God hates lukewarmness. He wants it either hot or cold. That's what he said. And when your life is just lukewarm, you know, I mean, you're right there. You're sitting on the fence. You're walking along. Hi, world. Hi, Lord. Hi, world. Hi, Lord. Everything's fine. I'm lukewarm. I've got sin. Lukewarmness is a sin. You know what that is? That's a sin of the age in which we live. Lukewarmness. I'll tell you something else. That is a sin of the age in which we live. Apostasy. You know what apostasy is? Apostasy is... You have fallen from a position that you were once standing in. That's what apostasy is. Apostasy and heresy differ somewhat. A man can be a heretic in ignorance. That doesn't make him right. But he can ignorantly be a heretic. He's been taught wrong. He didn't search it out. He didn't study it out. He didn't let the Holy Spirit lead him and guide him. And he believes something that had been taught to him. And he's an ignorant heretic. But an apostate is not ignorant. Because apostasy means you once took that position and then you departed from that position. You fell from that position. That's a sin of this age. Look around you. Look around at some of the big churches that once were having a tremendous effect because they were serious about God. And look what they're doing today. They're apostate. It's a sin of the age. I'll tell you another sin of the age. Materialism. <laughs> you say, is there anything wrong with having things? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there is. Those things can take you away from God. The more junk you have, the more things you have that can just take you away from doing what God wants you to do. And we live in a materialistic society in a materialistic age. And brother, I'll tell you what, the reason why a lot of Christians are not serving God is because they're too busy paying the bills and making a living and buying junk. Materialism is a collective sin of this age. And if you're not careful, you can very easily get caught up in materialism. Now listen, I'm just as prone to that stuff as you are. I like junk. I like things. I've got to watch it. That's why God keeps me poor. <laughs> That's why He gave me six kids and no money. <laughs> so I couldn't get drawn away with all the junk that's out there. Brother, I'll tell you what, I'd just go after it just as quick as a rabbit dog after a rabbit. If God hadn't have fixed me, so I couldn't. <laughs> but it's a sin. It's a sin of the same. And you know something? That sin has to be dealt with. It's a collective sin. Let me tell you something else that's a sin. Indifference. Indifference is a sin. When you come to the place where you're just indifferent, you say, Ah, oh, Brother McDowell, come on, man. Wind this baby up and let's go. When you come to the place where you can come in here and you can sit and you can listen and the Word of God can be preached and I can preach it and I can preach it and a hundred other guys can come in here and preach it and nothing ever moves you, nothing ever stirs you, nothing ever affects you, nothing ever causes you to cry out in repentance unto God. You're indifferent. And it's a sin of this age. And that's exactly what the devil wants. You know why God blessed Asa? Because Asa got serious. He made a covenant. He got rid of the idols. He dealt with sin. And brother, if we're going to be serious, then we're going to have to deal with sin. We're going to have to deal with sin collectively as a church. Not only are there sins that affect us in this age, but there are sins that affect you as a church. You know, it's not big problems that mess up Bible-believing churches. It's little problems. My wife, I got a phone call. 
This church that I'm pastoring, they, they have done some things just out of tradition. I mean, traditionally, at Christmas time, they have always made up baskets, fruit baskets. And the purpose of this was giving them to people that are needy, people that we could be a blessing to. I said, well, go ahead and do it. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Go ahead and do it. Well, then they started, they had a list, you know, and every year the list got a little bigger and a little bigger and a little bigger. And then somebody lost the list. I said, oh, praise God, we'll just start a new list. And you know, they had a lady on that list that donated the property that the church sits on. And every year, they gave her a fruit basket. She has more money than probably half of us in this church could come up with. And she didn't get her fruit basket. And she called one of the members of the church, and while the person got all upset, and pretty soon this big old riffle is gone undercurrent through the church. Mrs. Ryan didn't get her fruit basket. And a lady called me and said, Brother McDowell, I think it would be wise in this situation for me to go ahead and just make up a fruit basket for Mrs. Ryan and take that thing over there. I said, Do what you want to do. <laughs> I didn't say, Yeah, I didn't say, No. I said, Just do what you want to do. And it was probably the wisest thing to do, knowing how that little town is. But you know something? I was surprised at the people that go, <laughs> Well, you know what my wife told me the other night? She said, we have to have a talk, Bruce. And I said, oh, you know, the woman, I don't know whether it's like us in this church, but I don't know whether it's like us or Shirley, but my wife gets caught right in the middle. They won't come to me. I don't know why. I say, come to me. Please come to me. If you've got a problem, bring it right here. Tell me about it. They go to my wife. I said, I don't want to hear it. You tell them to come to me. <laughs> but they take it to her, and she, and she, you know, she's trying to use some wisdom, and she's trying to, don't, now, don't get upset about this, honey. I, I want to tell you, that there's a little problem here. I said, well, what's the problem? She said, you know that little red table in the nursery? I said, yeah. She said, well, so-and-so gave that to the church 10 years ago, and they want it back. <laughs> I said, and I said, well, go ahead. Give the table back. No problem, man. Give that piece of junk back. She said, well, that's not the problem. I said, oh, well, well, what's the problem? She said, there were four little chairs that went with the table. <laughs> and they're missing. She said, do you know what happened to them? Yeah. I took them to the junk pile. <laughs> I loaded them up on the back of a pickup truck. Don't let this tape get down the sink. And I junked them babies because they were junk. And some little kid, they had sharp edges on them. Some little kid was going to fall on them. And she said, oh, it just has so-and-so all upset about those chairs. What are we going to do? I said, we're not going to do nothing. Give that Indian, give her back that table and tell her to forget the chairs. They never come to church. I'm not going to worry about them. And they'll probably go out there and run their mouth. But you know, that's the little kind of nitpicking junk that just keeps people all stirred up in a church. Silly. Stupid. Little, I mean, nonsense. No, not a lick of importance connected with it whatsoever. You know what will keep a church messed up? Envy. Jealousy. Strife. Division. Gossip. Backbiting. Ill feelings. Grudges. Brother, I'll tell you what, you just watch the Holy Ghost say bye-bye. Those kind of things, they have to be dealt with. And then I want you to notice this, that Asa also dealt with sin in his own family. Look in verse 10, or verse, verse 16. Why did I say verse 10? Look in verse 16. And also concerning Maacah, the mother of Asa, the king, he removed her from being queen. Why? Because she made an idol in the grove, and Asa cut down her idol and stamped it and burned it at the brook of Hebron. You know what Asa did? He says, there is sin, not only in the kingdom with these abominable idols, and not only with these sodomites, but there's sin right here at the house, and I'm going to deal with it. And he said, Mom, you're not the queen any longer. And your idol is history. And he dealt with sin in his own family. You know where Eli failed? Eli over there in 1 Samuel. Eli failed because he had two sons that were committing 
whoredoms with the women of Israel and uh, doing abominable things with the sacrifices that were bring, being brought in. And Eli knew about it and he didn't do a thing about it. And brother, let me tell you something. When it comes to sin in my life, I'm responsible for dealing with it. When it comes for sin, as far as collectively, we're all responsible of dealing with it. But if you're going to be serious about God, we have to deal with sin in our family. And it's going to surface. And it's got to be dealt with. You see, Asa was a man that was blessed of God because he got serious. And when he got serious, he dealt with sin. You serious? Huh? Don't deal with sin? I want you to notice something else. Turn back to chapter 14 for a moment. It says in Second Chronicles chapter 14 that Asa also pointed the people to the book. Look in verse 4. I'll read verse 3. And he took away the altars of the strange God and the high places and break down the images and cut down the groves and commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to do the law and the commandment. You know where Asa pointed these people? He pointed them to the book. He didn't point them to him. He didn't say, look at me. He said, look at the law. Look at the statutes. Look at the commandments of God. He pointed those people to the book. We're living in a day and age of spotlighting Christianity. We're living in a day and age where we exalt flesh. We're living in a time when we put our stamp of approval on certain people and we say, oh, they're the greatest, aren't they wonderful, hallelujah, hip hip hooray for so and so. Baloney with that stuff. Brother, people need to be pointed to the Word of God. And, and uh, you start exalting self or exalting man or exalting flesh, then you're going to see that the Lord is not going to bless I have fellows call me all the time. They call me about coming in. They, you know, missionaries, they want to come in, present their work. I have singers call me. They want to come in and sing. They got this singing ministry. And these people call me, you know. You know what I find out? I say, well, what do you want to come in for? Well, I'm a missionary. I'm going to so-and-so. Well, what do you want to come in for? Well, I'm trying to raise support. I say, well, what if I can't support you? Oh, well, uh, I'd still like to come and present the work. Why? Why do you? I want to find out why they want to come in. And if that guy tells me, well, Brother McDowell, the reason I want to come in is because God's laid a burden on my heart for these people over in, in Papua New Guinea, and God uh, has called me to that place, and I just want people to pray for me, and if the church can support me, fine. If it can't support me, fine. But I'm interested in just making people aware of the burden that God's laid on my heart to go to these people, and I'm trying to do whatever I can do to get there. I say, come on! <laughs> I'm not interested in somebody that's trying to build a big work or build a big ministry or build a... I'm going to go to the mission field and I'm going to do this and start a school and start a church and go... I'm not interested in all that. I'm interested in the burden God has placed upon their heart to go to where they are gone that I might remember it and pray for them. People need to be directed to the Word of God. When I came to the little church down there in Sinking Spring, I told the people, I said, listen... As long as I'm pastoring this church. I said, we'll make decisions as how this church is run together. But there will only be one person deciding who's going to be behind this pulpit. And that's me. And if I can't have that, then you don't want me. Because I will not have anyone in that church preaching to my people unless I've asked them first. Do you believe this King James Bible is the Word of God? And if they say yes, I'm going to say, why? And brother, if they don't believe the Bible, they're not going to stand there. You say, well, you just got a little church down there, 50 people, so what? So what? Those are 50 people God made me responsible for. And those are 50 people that I'm going to preach the Word of God to. And, and when I get in the pulpit, it's not going to be in there with some Mickey Mouse. It's going to be in there with this old King James Bible because I'm going to point people to this book and I'm going to say, let's forget about what you've learned in the past. Forget about what the Grace Brethren have taught. Forget about where the fellowship's gone. Forget about what other pastors have told you and other evangelists have told you. And find out what this book says. And that's the way it's going to be. You know what Asa did? He pointed people toward the book. And then I want you to notice this. It says there in verse, uh, it says in verse 12, and they entered into a covenant, in verse 15 and 12, and they entered into a covenant to seek 
the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart and with all their soul. You know, not only did he command Judah to look at the law of the Lord and the statutes of the Lord, but he commanded Judah to seek the Lord with all their heart. Our covenant is this book right here. And brother, I'll tell you what, we need to learn how to quit just reading the Bible. We all know how to read the Bible. But you know what I found out? I found out that my reading the Bible doesn't do me any good if the Bible doesn't speak when I read. You know what I'm saying? If these words are not saying something to me, if the Holy Spirit is not taking the words, the living words of the living God and transforming my life through the words that I'm reading, then I'm just reading a book. And it's not doing anything for me. But see, this isn't just a book. This is a book that when the person, the recipient, takes it and reads it and allows God to speak to him through that book, it'll make changes in his life. My life as a Christian has been a series of changes. <laughs> you say, oh, we don't change around here. Yeah, that might be the problem. I change all the time. God shows me something. I say, okay, Lord, by your grace, give me the strength. Give me the grace. I want to change it. You're right. I'm wrong. Whatever you say is right. Whatever I think about it, whatever I say about it is wrong if it doesn't agree with you. And you know, I have found that the only way I can have a relationship with God is to make the changes God wants me to make. Ace got serious. You say, what happened? Well, in closing, let's take a look. It says there in verse 17 of chapter 15, But the high places were not taken out of the way of Israel. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was perfect all these days. And then it says down there in verse 19, And there was no more war under the five and thirtieth year of the reign of Asa. You say, well, Asa went 35 years in peace. That's right. He reigned 41 years. 35 of it was peace. You say, what happened? Well, in verse 16, verse 16, it says in verse 7, And at that time Hananiah the seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said unto him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria, and not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Syria encamped out of thine hand. Look in verse 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. Then Asa was wroth with the seer and put him in a prison house, for he was in a rage with him because of this thing. And Asa oppressed some of the people at the same time. The seer comes in and says, hey buddy, you messed up. You've done wrong. Your heart's not right anymore with God. You started out, it was right. You started out, you were trusting the Lord. You started out and you were serious about God and made a covenant with God, but you came to the place where you relied on the king of Assyria. <laughs> Asa said, man, I'm the king. You can't tell me that. You're nothing but a little two-bit prophet. Go to jail. I'll show you who's boss around here. Go to jail. God showed Asa who was boss. Verse 12, And Asa in the thirty and ninth year of his reign was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease he sought not to the Lord, but to the physician. Asa no longer going to God. Asa no longer trusting in God. It says in verse 13, And Asa slept with his fathers and died in the one and fortieth year of his reign. They buried him in his own sepulchers, which he had made for himself in the city of David, and laid him in a bed which was filled with sweet odors and divers kinds of spices prepared by the apothecary to art. And they made a very great burning for him. See, the last few years of his reign, he went astray. Listen, folks, we're down on the home stretch. The Lord's coming back. We don't have much time. Some of you in here, you started out good years ago. Are you serious tonight? 
Some of you years ago, man, God, if you just do this one thing, I'll do anything you want me to do. I'll live for you. I'll serve you. I mean business, God. I'm serious. And God blessed you and He blessed you and He blessed you. And you departed and you departed and you departed. And you're here. You're in a good church. You believe the Bible. But are you serious about God? Let's stand the Lord. Bow our heads for a moment. We're going to pray here in a few minutes. <clears throat> while you're praying, while you're searching your heart, maybe you need to come sit down at the altar with God and just ask the Lord to help you out. Maybe tonight you're in here and you know there's some things that uh, one time you were dead serious about and now you're just not as serious about those things. There, there, were, there was a time when you wouldn't leave the house without a pocket full of tracks and now you leave it all the time. There was a time when you wouldn't think about going through the course of a week without reading your Bible and now you find yourself hitting and missing once or twice a week and you're not serious about it anymore. There was a time when you'd have rather had somebody beat you up than miss a service at this church. Now you can take it or leave. There's other things more important. Other things have entered in. You say, well, things change. You know, God doesn't change. Like Bob Jones Sr. said, and sometimes it's hard to figure out and hard to understand, but duties never conflict. What about it? Are you serious tonight? You need to come and pray while the piano's playing before we sing. Just slip out of your seat. Maybe you need to come down and renew some vows with God. I don't discourage somebody from making a vow. I tell them, listen, you mean business, you make the thing. But you die before you break it. You die before you break it but mean business with God. You want God to get serious and use you and get serious about you? Then you get serious about God. Asa did. God blessed him. How about you? You want God to bless your life? Our Heavenly Father, tonight, Lord, I pray that you would speak to hearts, that you would deal with us, Lord. Father, I need to be dealt with. And God, I know that there's times when I am just not as serious as what I am right now. And Lord, I know that there's times, there's going to be times down the road that that my seriousness in serving you is, is going to try to be limited and is going to try to be dulled by the devil. And God, I pray that you wouldn't let that happen. And Father, maybe that's happened to some of these people in here tonight. And God, I know there's some people that love you and there's some people that, that are good people. But God, there are people in this church standing here right tonight and they're no longer serious about you and about serving you and about being dedicated to you and consecrated to you and living for you. And God, you've blessed their life and you've given them things. You've given them families and homes and money and, and, and food and clothing and blessed them in a thousand different ways. God, I pray that they'd be serious tonight. Father, I believe that if you would just stir up the hearts of some people in this church to get back to serious living for you and serving you, that you can use this church in a greater way than you've ever used it before. And I pray, God, that you would. Lord, deal with hearts now. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. What page will we 384, page 384. Lord, I'm coming home. And as we sing this song tonight, you know that God spoke to your heart. Don't stand back there and say, well, I'll, I'll do something about it later. If God has spoken to your heart tonight, do something. You say, well, God's spoken to my heart, but man, there's a whole bunch of other people in here and I know they are not serious. Well, forget them. God spoke to you. Forget the guy next to you. Forget the person behind you. Forget the person in front of you. Forget Brother Art. Forget me. You have an obligation to do what God wants you to do tonight. If you're not serious, why don't you get serious? Because you see, I believe serving the Lord Jesus Christ is the most serious business in this world. And at the judgment seat of Christ, we're going to find out how serious it was. Paul says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. The terror of the Lord. You know what he said that in light of? The judgment seat of Christ. As we sing, you need to come and pray, you come. I God, I pray for God.
bow our heads for just a minute. Before we sing any more, let's just bow our heads. Now listen, folks. It's 9 o'clock. We've been here for two hours. I didn't preach long tonight because you guys stuck around fellowship long last night. That's not why I did it. I didn't preach long tonight just to be a smart aleck or to be mean or anything like that. You know the only reason I preached as long as I did tonight? Because God let me. Because God let me. Now we're going to just be a few more minutes in here. But these next few minutes can be the most important minutes. It can be the most important minutes in the future of your life and in the future of this church. How serious are we? Persecution may right be on the horizon, folks. How serious are we? The Muslims would like to come over to this country and do us in for what we did over there. How serious are we? Al Gore already said, if you're a fundamental Christian to believe the prophecy of the Bible, you need to be put away from this society because you're a threat. How serious are we? The good times and the easy times may well be over. How serious are we about serving God? God spoke to your heart tonight. Piano plays just the next few minutes. You do what God wants you to do. Okay, keep your heads bowed now, and I want to ask, uh, ask Bruce, if he would, to close out the word of prayer at this time. Ask God for safety, and that God would lead us all the way to the rapture, especially if you have blessing of those that are serious about the Lord. Bruce. Man, you're dismissed.